When you anybody's taken a song that somebody else has already made mag magical, the most important thing is if you're going to cover it as a group of musicians, you've got to find your sound for it. You got to be, it's got to be you, because otherwise you won't believe it. Yeah. You won't believe it when I walk on a stage and sing it. Well, no, the I'm, world doesn't need it, but unless it's your version. That's right. We made it ours. Yeah. I'm very good. How are you, Chris? I'm very, nice to see you. I, I'm very good. Great to see you too. Yeah. I'm very good. Uh, I'm happy to be here to discuss this this new record with you. Well, this is the first time I've done something like this. You mean not on a computer? Not on a computer since actually recording this record with a group of people. Oh, that's the last group you were in. That's the last group yeah. doing anything that was creative or work related. It took a while, you know, as it did for everybody, but to first kind of venture out. I feel like you're a pretty social guy. Are well, you a that's a bit of a myth, I think. Oh, it's a, <laughs> yeah. a self-perpetuated myth? I, yeah, just... um, I have learned about myself in the last couple of years that I like spending time with myself. I like to, uh, you know, do simple stuff, take long walks, go on the yeah. beach. I've always actually uh, found myself gravitating towards places that are close to the ocean. It's a sort of fantasy of mine to go back to California and live out there. Well, somewhere. I know, that's fine, because we talked about this a yeah, little bit, yeah. but... It yeah. is a fantasy. You're I like think. a New York guy now. I am a and New York guy, I know you, yeah. you made this record in Malibu. Yeah. And, and I mean, Shangri-La is about as good as it gets as far as California that's goes. That's about as, like, <laughs> it, it's, I mean, it really is. Shangri-La is a very fitting name for the place, yeah. too. It really was a magical sort of place, and you sensed it as soon as you walked in there. I mean, I think that's the myth about a lot of recording studios. I think that one particularly delivers on that promise. Uh, yeah, you're right. Shangri-La was uh, something else. I stayed in this little hotel out there, actually, in Malibu that's um, just off Carbon Beach, and it was beautiful. Every morning I'd wake up to the ocean. So I was on New York time, and yeah. so I was kind of like waking up super early anyway, so I'd kind of like, sneak out of the hotel and walk up the beach when as the sun was coming up it was kind of amazing i did that pretty much every morning and then i would get in my car and drive up the coast a bit to where shangri-la was or past all the beaches this sounds you know past this sounds shares, yeah. beautiful <laughs> yeah. like castle on yeah, the cliff yeah. you know and it was kind of like it was sort of like this fantasy magical thing and i thought wow years and years ago all the bands like Neil Young and Crazy, like all these bands that have been here and made this drive. But for me, yeah. coming from New York and, and doing that every day and then arriving at Shangri-La and sort of you walk in there, everyone's sitting around and there's a big kitchen and, you know, we'd have coffee and then we'd just go and work. Now, it sounds like a, a relaxed atmosphere. It was. And you took yourself also, I think you put yourself somewhere different, which I, I feel like is... It was a bit of a risk, actually. You feel like that because it was so new to you? It was a risk because it could have, like, been too comfortable. Sure, sure, you know, sure, like, sure. Yes, yeah. And too kind of, like, too laid back. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, you got to work. You're making music. But the feel that we wanted to get for this record ended up being exactly what that was. The place forces you to... First of all, communicate in a room together. There's this big sort of live room. Because you guys did this live. It was done, it was done live. The studio control room kind of overlooks this live space. Mm. I mean, there's only glass separating it and a door. But you could, I could sit from this position where my, I sang in the control room. Mm. So I'm set up in there and I can see everybody. Uh, you know, Wendy and TJ and Janet, who are singing, they're sort of in a room just off to the, to the left. And, but all the band are right here in front of me. That's the first time I've ever done that, really, in recording. Really? Yeah, when it's like that, we were actually making this together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At the end of the evening, we would throw down a rough sort of monitor mix or whatever of it and, and leave it at that. And then the next day, pretty much, we started a new song. Now, we'd done some pre-production work, so a few of the musicians um, uh, had been already uh, Kev, the drums, and, and Tony on guitar, and Sean as well, who plays keyboards and stuff. And with Rich as well, Rich Machin, they, they had kind of been working up yeah. ideas for how we were going to go with tempo so, arrangement yeah. you know key which i'd been back and forth uh with with about what where it felt comfortable for me 
So once we got there, we sort of, on some of the songs, not all of them, because some of them changed when we got there, and, and some, uh, like Roland S. Howard's uh, version of, you know, of Shut Me Down, that came about in the studio. We were toying with the idea of doing a Nick Cave and the Bad Sea song at that, uh, that particular time, and then Rich kind of like threw out there, you know, quite sort of late in the game, how about this song, you know, Shut Me Down? And, and I was like, okay. And so I, you know, we sort of listened to it for a bit and it, that came together, you know, it wasn't something we were planning. Sure. But it, but it fit. I'm standing in a suit as... Dave kind of floated the idea of doing a covers record and then we kind of got on the phone a couple of weeks later um, just started kind of throwing ideas at each other backwards and forwards, like kind of thing. And then, you know, I would shoot him some tracks over and he'd shoot me some over. And we just did that for a little while until we had like a little pot of, um, of ideas and then kind of whittled it down from there. You know, th there's some unusual tracks, some kind of well-known tracks. Like, it, you know, we weren't precious or pretentious about any of it. It was just stuff, I like this one because I like this one because. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, you can't overthink that shit. It's like, I like this song for a reason. Let's give it a shot. Yeah, you know, if I'd have done this 20 years ago, like, it would be, no, I can only do things that nobody's ever heard of. I'm not of sure course, what yeah, a pretentious yeah. piece of shit I am. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. With age becomes, like, you know, th those things just are not important. We did a, a great version of Manhattan from Cat Power as well, and we also did a version of um, I Go to Sleep from The Pretenders, which at the time, before we actually started recording, I thought was really going to fit. Um, but when I started to visualise, because it's kind of how this thing was going to sequence, and how the two sides of the record were kind of starting to play out for me in, yeah. my, in my head, as we were recording, I couldn't find a place for those. Sure. I mean, the, the song selection in general, though, yeah. I think, I found really interesting. Because so, I think it's it's the beauty of this is it's some songs you know, some songs you don't. And mm -hmm. also I think there's an, a, a, a thing in play where it's like, I know this song, but I didn't know who actually wrote it. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm, uh, there's a famous version that I'd heard before, but but the, the original I hadn't heard before. Were some of these new to you, or these songs that you had been thinking about and listening to for a very long time, like years and years? No, some were... Some were newish. Yeah, um, <laughs> that I might have heard a long time ago, but then left it alone. And, yeah. I, and when I came back to it, it, was like, wow, this is a great song. Yeah, not the ones that you'd expect. Not 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 Neil Young. Sure, or, sure. Of you course, know, there were certain things of course, but not PJ Harvey, for instance. Like I was very familiar with that song and wanted to do a a much more sort of raucous version of the song. Mm. And Bob Dylan, that that album in particular, I was very familiar with. Yeah. With Imposter, yeah. I know the sequencing is really important to you. Yeah. Was that kind of predetermined or after you finished recording? You know, that's an interesting question because uh, it was not predetermined. I've always been big on the sequencing on things, actually, with when I think about it with other records. When you perform live, you feel what's not working mm. in, a, in a show, yeah. in a set. You know when a song comes up, it, and it might be a song that has been particularly successful, but it's just not working yeah. in the set, where it is, it's the, the right pace, time. the tempo, the feel, and people's faces, you feel it, You and they, they ch it changes, like, oh, this is... Not, not now. You know, it's not now. And so the same thing happens for me with a record, um, and this one started to play itself out, for me, sequencing-wise, as we were doing it. Like I started to see the pieces of the puzzle going where they're supposed to be. Not that we were recording in that way necessarily. We just kind of picked something and went, let's go for this today. But then towards the end of the three weeks or so that it was, I already had a pretty strong idea of how I felt. I certainly, how the dark end of the street was going to start it. Mm -hmm. The first side to me of the record was going to end with Metal Heart. Mm -hmm. That was the end of that chapter, mm -hmm. if you like. And then the next part was going to start with Shut Me Down. Kind of a little sort of punch, one, two punch there of Metal Heart to mm -hmm. Shut Me Down. And then and then ending with Always On My Mind. Yeah. And that song was always like reflecting, certainly in the last sort of 20 years of my life, and you go through lots of stuff. Yeah. And yeah. in yeah. 20 years, in 22 years, it's like, you know, it's not all great times. 
and, it, and there are really great times and there's times when it's just like this is not working with not you know the songs sort of reflect that uh, somehow it's not and it's not just in my personal relationships it's in a relationship with the members of my band yeah. for the last 40 years there's also this mm -hmm. love hate uh, relationship music does that for me and it's like you know, I I quite often from a song learn a lot more about myself than I have from years and years of therapy <laughs> <laughs> a lot of money if you live in New York if you're not seeing a shrink there's something wrong with you that's that is honest that's so I learned that so, so you're saying the sequencing particularly tells the story of your life in a way from the last 20 years or even before that I, I, I wasn't aware of that sure you sure. know like to be honest and I and this often happens to me with records um, not just the ones that I've made, uh, I've been part of making, other people's. And that's what happened with this record, was I realised that other people's songs, other people's voices, more importantly, mm. the way they sang them, the way they interpret the words, and the way that falls for me, I feel at home with it, I identify with it, it, it comforts me more than anything else. I mean, that's a very nice thing to say about these songs. Yeah, but there's not one performer there that I have not been moved by, mm -hmm. and their journeys have not been easy. No, of course not. Uh, no, no, no. You know, <laughs> well, the best ones, I mean, you never know, are. And the best, and they never are. And then, you know, your classic sort of uh, versions of certain songs that are here, you know, Smile is a sort of timeless song. Mm -hmm. And the fact that somehow Charles Chaplin was involved in writing yeah. that. Um, just a bonus. It just, it's just super bonus yeah. because he was the king of being the imposter. Yeah, you're right. I mean, and, and he didn't get to speak or anything. Yeah. He did it all with this, just, just with um, his, his interpretation from himself, you know, uh, on film, cinematically. Happy, sad, mm. clown. He epitomizes. Yeah, for sure. To be honest, what this record kind of is for me in that way as well. Hiding behind a song, hiding within a song, hiding behind a performance, hiding within a performance. Being a character in that rather than it's actually me. And then finding out, actually, it's a lot of me. Mm. I vicariously have lived through this for the last 40 years. Mm. Lilac kind of Wine was probably uh, the one that we wrestled with a little bit in terms of tempo. I think at first Martin was playing electric bass and he was quite concerned actually about, you know, of course, and he's performing it and it's a performance. So that what he was doing was accurate and right. And, mm. uh, and afterwards, you know, it was funny, it was a little moment. We, and we got it, we, 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 got the, we got it finally. And we sort of looked at each other and that was it. That's it. Don't, let's not mess with it. And then later in that evening, we went out to the kitchen or wherever to, to eat. And when I come back in, and my time was sitting with Eric, the engineer, at the, at the Pro Tools, and he was in there because we were running everything. Yeah. And, and he was starting to look at his part. And I was like, uh, what are you doing? No, what are you no, doing? No, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> I was like, what are you doing? And he was like, I'm just going to do I've got a few clicks on the, my yeah. finger was clicking on, on, on the fretboard. No, no, no. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. And he, he kind of got angry, you know, and I understood. He said, you know, people are going to hear this. And I made some mistakes. I was like, yeah, well, we all did. <laughs> and, and, you know, there's, you know, and it might swing in and out of time and properly at time, you know, or whatever. But I said, that's going to be what's important about this record later on. And it's not because of being all flashy and everything's going to be correct. That is the way life is and music should be. It's not perfect, but to get your performance in there and, it, and, and, and struggle with that a bit together and, you know, get it there, uh, it's kind of a magical thing. I don't know if that's done so much anymore. It's unfortunately not. And that's, yeah. I mean, I think that's the reason to record live. Yeah. That's the whole point is yeah, to, that capture, was, that, that was, to that, capture that stuff. Right, that was the point and that was the experiment here. Metal heart. It will work great live. It catches the moment when you do things like that, you know? Um, and I knew that studio had a great live room that historically, you know, that's how records were made there, you know, in that room. A lot of people, you just plug in and play. And we'd set everybody up in the room and that was it. It was like, you know, we're just going to play through stuff in the morning and then the afternoon we're going to record stuff 
and we'll listen back. Maybe it was take five, maybe it was take seven. Just pick which one felt the best. Um, and that's it. And we did a song a day, like kind of, you know. Oh, it's old school. It's, it's like yeah. kind of old school. Eventually, like, you know, if you do things the other way with Pro Tools and you're fixing everything, and you just, everything becomes sterile. You know, and it, it's like all perfect. And, but like, it's the old adage you can perfection is beauty. You know, it's like, yeah, you know, take seven. He kind of screwed that bit up a little bit, but it still sounds great and it feels great. And that's real life. So let's just leave it, you know? Like you're saying, there's like a feeling in the room that can only be captured this way. Yeah, exactly. And um, that was really important to do it this way, particularly for like a covers record. You know, I wanted it to have like that kind of energy in it. It creates more of an intimacy as well, because it should draw you in. So when you listen to it, you feel like you're in the room at the time as well. You know, Rich and I, had, you know, Soul Savers mm -hmm. and myself, we have made two other records together that were live-ish, <laughs> but they weren't live together. I wasn't ever singing in the same room as these guys at the same time on the same day. It was all pieced together later. This was different. This was the first time that we were all in one space together for that time. And that was kind of lucky as well. A new addition to the uh, was James Walburn, the uh, Play on guitar, mm -hmm. him and Tony playing guitars. They, I don't know if they'd worked together before, but it just worked. Clicked. That was also kind of lucky. Yeah. It could have not, but James was an amazing new addition for me anyway uh, in the process. Cause when we were doing the performances, he would be right there looking right at me. You know, staring you down. And it was, we were, yeah, in a good way. Yeah, there was a communication going yeah. on that was purely few. We, we didn't know each other at all. We met for the first time, but I felt a connection immediately. Yeah. What we found out making this record was that they really can. They're such great, solid songs that you can perform them in many different ways. Metal Heart for me is probably my favorite at the moment. Uh, just you know, it changes a little bit, but like I can really see see that being such a great performance live. Cause it just had this arc from this little thing that grows into this monster. And the, the whole kind of sentiment of the song for me as well as this also kind of the performer, the actor, the character who has been sort of become too big for his own boots really. And can't keep up with the enormity of what it's become yeah, what it's and it's totally crazy. lost in there yeah, yeah, but yeah. it's trapped in some like little cage you yeah, know no, of uh, course yeah of so course. Yeah, but in the song in the performance that we did it breaks out of that and at the end janet who's singing she just kind of broke out i said to her you know just let let it go like we got what we're gonna do that at the end of it just let it go yeah, just right. sing whatever you feel like look at the words throw out what you feel and she just she went off and it was just so awesome. You could hear her sort of punching in at the end of the song. She sang with my band as well, with Depeche Mode, uh, on stage with us for, 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 for quite a few tours. So we have, uh, we had a history, we have a history. I was going to say, I like the mix though. I feel like for Imposter, yeah. it's, it's, you know, some people that you've been working with forever. It's some new people. There's, a, there's new people that I never before. And there's some that I've been working with, you know, on records and, and performing on stage with for like nearly 10 years now. You know, I'm fortunate, but I've got this fantastic band, Tepesh Mode. And then I'm also, I also get to work with these other musicians and this other act, uh, Soul Savers, um, and step in and do things. And this is a little different because it's not songs that we wrote together. It's, it changes the process. It's a, it's a different thing. It is a, I feel like it's a thing on its own, although it feels like a Soul Savers record too. It, it's, it's a Dave Garn thing. Mm -hmm. I could have turned around and said, guys, I really want you to be the band. You are the band, you are Soul Savers, but this is a Dave Garn record. Yeah. And like, I've got, you know, it sort of turned into that for me. I suddenly had to stand up there and I'm the I'm the guy. I'm the front guy, aren't yeah. I? I've got to I got to like I got to carry this. I really got to do this. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? I was suddenly you know it feels like that. It feels like I'm all in. Like okay, good. This is who I am right now. This is this record re represents 
me right now. It represents what feels like what's going on around me. We don't, it's, it's this uncertainty. You know, no, the word, the title is heavy. The title is heavy. It can mean a lot of things. And all those things came up in my mind in it all. Like, wow, but we all hide behind something. This kind of feels right, you know? And look, I've been lucky, like I said before, like I've been lucky enough to be involved in lots of records like that and music and times where it's like, wow, we're, we're riding high here. Mm. This is the right time for this. Somehow, it just happened to be like that. That's not always the case. I mean, that's what I think that this, this feels really personal. To, like, imposter feels really personal and it feels like, I don't know if quiet is the right word, but like intimate, mm -hmm. I think, is maybe more of the right word. I mean, to me, it feels honest. Yeah. And I, I don't know why. Sure. But it does. And it's a little, like, when I play it and listen to it, when I'm singing along to songs now and kind of just getting my voice kind of worked up, feels a little, you know, vulnerable and, yeah. uh, but also exciting. Yeah. And so I'm like, again, I go, oh, that's cause it's, that's cause it's honest. I feel like that's me, you know, in there. And I'm listening to my voice uh, back and I'm like, that's the most honest performance I could have done. And you know, look, I'm, I'm standing in big shoes there. Like say, you know, we all know the Elvis Presley version of Always On My Mind. You know, we always, we all know Nat King Cole's version of Smile and like, they're done, they're good. They're, they're, you don't mess with that, <laughs> yeah, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, I know it's kind of like, look, someone's even said to me, look, I didn't, honestly, I hadn't heard the Jeff Buckley version of Lilac Wine. And people were like, really? That was like, he sort of nailed it. And yeah. I'm like, so of course I listened, but I hadn't, mine was Nina Simone. Yeah. I, I hadn't would, heard it. And, and Anton Corbin, who, you know, has worked with us for years and, my de de and a dear friend, he had said to, uh, you know, when he first heard the record, he said to Jonathan, uh, my manager, was, he said, oh, that was very, uh, you know, very brave of Dave to, to cover, you know, uh, Jeff Buckley song. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, and, it's actually. Yeah, and uh, he's Dutch. Um, <laughs> and Jonathan was, was what, it's actually Nina Simone, right? Uh, and he's like, I did. So of course I was like, well, listen, and then I listened to Jeff Buckley's version and you know what? Um, brilliant. Yeah. Awesome. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. But my version is different. Yeah. We made it ours. Yeah. When you, anybody's taken a song that somebody else has already made magic, magical, there's, there's already, there's already a beautiful, brilliant version there. The most important thing is if you're going to cover it as a group of musicians, as a band or whatever it is, you got to find your sound. You got to find your sound for it. You got to be. It's got to be you. That was what took me a while. I did study the songs. I knew some of them more than others, but the, I I really listened to them a lot. I got to I got to interpret it my way, because otherwise it won't be. It it won't you 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 won't believe it. Yeah. Well, the um, world doesn't need it. But unless it's your version. That's right. But then walking on stage as well. The the key part of this is as well. There is that imposter element to it, you see, where you're walking on a stage and you're singing a song, you're already stepping into something else. Mm. Like it always feels a little bit like um, you're stealing from someone else or mm. something else, uh, that you always were a little bit of an imposter. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I'm sure you're ready to have this thing out yeah. into the world. Yeah, it's, come, it's out. Look, it's, now it's happening. So it's like out of my hands now. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. it's kind of like you got to let it go. And is that a hard, hope, pro is that a hard that, process or does it feel good? Yeah, a bit because look, and Rich will say this and when, when you talk to him as well, he'll say, it's like, look, he always says to me, mate, he said, this record's too important, mate, to, you know, not do the, not give it its best chance. Yeah. What is its best chance? I know that we made something special and I hope that other people when they're listening to it feel that from it. And it takes them on a little like kind of trip, especially people that love music and have done for years, as many years as I have. I don't think they'll be disappointed by this record. Yeah, great. I think we're good. Well, I mean, I need to ask the boss, but I feel. Good. I, don't know, I don't know how you feel. I don't know how you feel. The dark end of the street. That's where we 